the um, antioxidant, plant-based diet, et cetera, is allowed him to stay out of AFib. Uh, and we also uh, have gotten him off of the uh, milrinone, which is uh, an infusion. He was having to walk around with a pump. We got him off the milrinone, so he's doing much better. He's exercising. We still have a ways to go, but these patients can be, we can capture them, rescue from that slippery slope. We have to be very aggressive with uh, uh, a very aggressive antioxidant diet with uh, nutrient, superfood nutrients that help uh, improve myocardial function, improve overall biological um, and systemic uh, uh, function there. So I, I've said a, more than a mouthful, but I wanted to kind of sort of throw that information out. Um, and are there any questions y'all saw? Um, uh, I think we, uh, I don't know, I put everybody to sleep, I mesmerized them. Uh, the one says, um, I apologize, I'm driving. If uh, blood thinners are administered after heart surgery, uh, what precaution does a holistic coach have to be aware of? Um, so blood thinners, uh, again, depends on the, the type of blood thinners. And we use that word blood thinner. Um, they're, they're, they're medications that uh, inhibit platelets, uh, which you know helps with the early uh, formation of, uh, of uh, clot or thrombus. And then there are other medications, which we call anticoagulants, and they inhibit enzymes that, that lead to the direction, the, excuse me, production of, of um, uh, molecules that kind of stabilizes the clot. So, um, you know, some blood thinners, quote unquote, uh, uh, are used for arterial flow clots, i.e. antiplatelet agents, and some are used more for the venous side. They both have some, you know, inter cross interaction, but that's typically what we use. So it depends on the type of quote unquote blood thinner. Uh, it depends on the purpose. Uh, typically someone on a blood thinner, you just wanna be aware that if you injure yourself, uh, you know, be able to look out for bleeding because you may bleeding, swelling in the joint or something like that. It could be worse than if you have a joint injury, uh, but that's kind of the main. Any comments y'all have on blood thinners? Uh, yeah, I, I always, uh, you know, they're always, they're always cautioned about green foods and things, uh, foods that may have vitamin K in it. And I would just say, if you're working on your diet and you're working on a plant-based diet, uh, ask your doctor to watch closely your uh, levels, your levels, your blood thinner levels to check it. So you can see how much, how you can eat a healthy diet, you know, why maintaining a good level, but have your doctor work with you on that because some patients are just afraid to eat anything green otherwise. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I think um, um, particularly with warfarin and, and my experience with using warfarin is that we um, we just, you know, follow the levels and adjust it uh, accordingly. And most of the time, I don't have to do much adjusting of the, the warfarin levels. And there's so many other things that interact with warfarin. So you got to be aware of those things. So uh, the novel anti, the new anticoagulant agents uh, uh, are, are not affected. Uh, I don't think WARF is really effective. If we talk about it, I'm not aware of any okay. data that people do badly on plant-based diet, but everybody's, we talk about it so much that it's like, okay, let's, <laughs> let's do it. So I, I don't know, but somebody wants to know, is vitamin E a good blood thinner? I, I've never used vitamin E as a blood thinner. Uh, if any of you use it as a blood thinner? Yeah, no, I, I, I have not, but, you know, and, and we know that we don't want to, uh, you know, many vitamin Ds are synthetic, but um, no, I haven't seen it used that way. Um, sometimes with people with no severe cardiac problems, we could, you know, sometimes I've seen um, uh, capsaicin and, you know, being used um, for regulating the blood um, thinness or, or, uh, or on the other side, it seems to regulate. But um, no, I haven't used vitamin D that way. And, and what we do know, there's been studies showing that when you go on a plant-based diet, the there's a reduction in the viscosity of the blood. It, it's a reduction of this um, uh, consumption of animal protein increases the rheology of the, the thickness uh, of the blood and consuming a plant-based diet reverses that process. So. The, the the blood I mean that's a literal blood thinning the reduction in in the, the rheology or or, or, or or thickness of the sluggishness of the blood so sludging of the blood you know itself kind of potentiates plant formation and the like and so simply going on a plant based diet itself helps that process and reverses that 
Um, and, and so that's an important factor. It's really a natural progression. Uh, but, but typically, you know, patients with heart failure, uh, if they have atrial fibrillation, they be a, may, you know, may be on an anticoagulant. And uh, when we are, are, are naturally intervening with these patients, um, if we wean them, we look at, you know, their risk for stroke versus their risk for bleeding. Um, and we say, okay, if your AFib burden is, is severely reduced, uh, your diabetes are reversed, your high blood pressure reverse, and so on, their point score, we call it a chad vas score, their point score that suggests they're predisposed to stroke, if that goes down, then they're less likely to stroke. And so we may, in some certain cases, wean them off of blood thinner uh, because they've reversed a lot of those uh, 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 risk factors that's associated with stroke. So, so it all depends, and it's always an individual uh, uh, discussion had with the patient. <clears throat> Well, Baxter, thank you for sharing those slides. I think it shows how powerful it is for your for the uh, raw plant-based diet and how it can transform, you know, very severe uh, cardiovascular issues. And the first patient was at, you know, need, you know, at the dialysis, you know, the end stage uh, looks like end stage kidney function and. Uh, and improved quite a bit in addition to the cardiovascular. It's quite powerful. And, and thank you for sharing that to know that there's hope in, in changing our diet and our lifestyle and hydration. You know, the, the patient was, the first patient was, you know, so be dehydrated with, you know, um, medication and diet, you know. No, and that's exactly right. And I think, I mean, the hydration part, the most important nutrient is water. And we, we often forget about that. We talk about, you know, where do you get your protein? And what about this vitamin? <laughs> and we don't get a lot of uh, questions on water. But but yeah, he was so, with all the diuretics, he was so severely hydrated, dehydrated rather. Uh, uh, the simple life-saving thing for him is uh, aggressive hydration. Um, um, speak podcast, I have high blood pressure. I'd like to know what steps I can take right now to lower it without medications. Uh, anybody want to take that on or? Um... <laughs> well, I just think it's been said that plant-based diet, that raw plant-based diet is very powerful because you're not getting all those chemicals and preservatives and things like that that you're getting in, you know, processed and prepared and cooked food. So that's very powerful. Um, but um, it, it should be monitored very closely because we don't know how high your blood pressure is. We don't want you to have a stroke and any complications. So it's it's not easy to just say, oh, no, you don't need to take anything. You know, we don't know where you are, but definitely you need to monitor, have a blood pressure, um, you know, um, monitor and to monitor it and, and work with your doctor and, and keep, let them know how it's running. But your diet is the most powerful thing. Um, to uh, control blood pressure. Dr. McGregor, we have something to add for Brother Speak Podcast. Um, you know, our answer is gonna be diet because, or our nutrition, Not, I don't like using the word diet, but nutrition because that's kind of what we concentrate on. But the reality also is that sometimes we need help understanding what that means. Um, and that's why we do what we do because, you know, somebody telling you to eat better can mean many different things to many different people. And we all know in our practices, when we talk to our patients, that can mean so many different things. So when we're saying, you know, diet, that is kind of just to get your mind in the mindset and find somebody who can actually help you to understand and teach you what we mean by changing what we put in our body such that it can improve your health. Because you can think that you're doing the right thing for years and not get the improvements that you're seeing and then you get frustrated and say, forget it. So I'm just saying, you know, just be mindful of that. It's a process. It's a stepwise process. And it does sometimes take people to help us to get the results that we need. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. It is. And, 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 and high blood pressure can be a complex disorder to manage. But, but you're right. Starting with a healthy uh, plant-based nutritional regimen is where I start all of my patients. Because I see it as a foundation. It's sort of like saying, well, I need a house. I need to build a house. Where do I start? Well, you build the foundation. And so your foundation for uh, treating your health is going to be optimal nutrition. That's going to be removal of the bad and adding of the good. And then you're going to add other things, proper sleep, rest, you know, fresh air, sunshine, exercise. All those things are part of that foundation of your health. 
and then you know there may be nutraceuticals uh, uh, if needed. So maybe L-citrulline would be a nutraceutical that could be beneficial. Magnesium may or may not be a part of that, uh, and so you may add that. And then you know pharmaceutical only at its last resort. And so you start with the foundation: optimal nutrition, uh, fresh air, sunshine, exercise, rest, grounding. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, stress management, those types of things, then uh, nutraceuticals as needed and then pharmaceuticals as a last resort. So, so that's certainly, um, I agree with everything stated above. Uh, heart failure, heart murmur, CoQ10, um, what should be, so, you know, I use CoQ10 in a lot of patients with heart disease. Um, CoQ10 enhances mitochondrial function you know, you might argue that a lot of people need it, many more than we do. I use it aggressively in heart failure patients. Uh, people who were taking maybe over-the-counter medications, uh, Tylenol or supplements, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, of other types of uh, processed foods, chemical dyes, antibiotics, you know, they can have an adverse effect on your mitochondria. And so uh, CoQ10 uh, helps enhance mitochondrial function. It's an ubiquinone. So it can be beneficial early on. You may not have to take as much as someone with congestive heart failure. Uh, it can be beneficial. A baby aspirin daily, it all depends. You know, uh, in men, if you've had a heart attack, it may be beneficial. I typically use it in my patients who've had a heart attack. Women, it probably benefits in stroke more. Uh, but if uh, someone's coming in, they've had you know previous stroke, previous heart, it's previous, some, previous vascular event, uh, I may start them on a, a baby aspirin until I've got them fully converted onto a natural plant-based diet uh, and decrease inflammation by other means. You know, aspirin is an anti platelet agent. It is also anti-inflammatory, and those are probably two uh, mechanisms by which it helps. Uh, and so I tend to use that over other agents, but I tend to try to use that only transient until somebody's fully transitioned to a healthy uh, lifestyle. Anybody else, any other comments on that? No. Okay. Uh, let's see. What's the best way to lower blood pressure? I think we covered that. Lifestyle, uh, proper diet, etc. cetera. Uh, nutraceuticals needed. Um, it's consuming anyone a good way to thin the blood. Uh, it depends. Uh, it's probably not the best way if you have atrial fibrillation. Uh, you have to use an anticoagulant for that. Uh, but again, uh, it, it can help if, if you're dealing with coronary disease or vascular disease. Um, and get off blood pressure medications. Um, they're, they're lovely. Um, you getting off blood pressure medicines is a stepwise uh, process, like Dr. Um, uh, Palmer mentioned. Uh, so what exactly does an aspirin do? Does that thin the blood? It, it thins the blood by decreasing platelets from st uh, inhibiting platelets from sticking together. And uh, it decreases inflammation. Those are probably the two most important mechanisms. Dr. Can I throw, add something in? As sure. We were talking off camera about, and you know, a lot of people asking questions about their blood pressure. Um, and so the question that we were talking about with the cholesterol um, and you know, vascular disease itself, and a lot of people uh, feel like if you're eating cholesterol, that's what rises, makes your cholesterol rise. But you were saying it's not necessarily just that. Um, so can you elaborate on that for the audience so that they can kind of hear what we were discussing? So the issue of reducing cholesterol, I mean, the, the statin drugs have anti-inflammatory, you, you want me to talk in terms of context of the statin drugs itself or, or overall aspects of reducing cholesterol? Cholesterol. Yeah. So, I mean, cholesterol, uh, and I remember that conversation we had. <laughs> that I remember, okay, <laughs> this is a weekend off camera. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, so, so we, we look at cholesterol uh, as um, a process of, well, we're taking in fat, are we eating cholesterol, so the cholesterol goes up. And, and, and I think there's some truth to that. We've eaten a lot of, you know, shrimp and maybe, you know, cholesterol-laden foods, the cholesterol will go up, maybe you stop eating, it'll come down. However, I don't think it's as simple as that. I think cholesterol in, in and of itself is a, a signal uh, of abnormal metabolism. So when I see someone with hyperlipidemia, I think of them in a similar fashion to someone with hyperglycemia, uh, even though hyperglycemia is diabetes and hyperlipidemia is, we kind of put them in two different buckets. 
I think there's a common denominator aspect of this and that common denominator is abnormal metabolism. And there are probably other aspects of abnormal metabolism, but so let's say you have high cholesterol and you go on a whole food plant-based diet, low fat, so you're not eating any nuts or oils or whatever the case is, and say, I'm not eating cholesterol, why is my cholesterol still high? You still have to look at the, 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 the foods that you're eating and how you're preparing the foods and their preservatives, because, you know, foods that are microwaved or, or chemically uh, preserved, et cetera, uh, may adversely affect the liver. The liver is where cholesterol metabolism occurs. So abnormal liver metabolism will result in abnormal metabolism. Elevated cholesterol may just be an outward manifestation of that underlying biochemical process. I've had lots of patients come to me and they're eating a whole food plant-based diet, low fat, uh, and the cholesterol remains high. But then I look at how they're preparing the foods, what you know, the processing of chemicals, and I remove that processing element, and then the cholesterol comes down. Inflammation comes down. And so the, the mechanism of hypercholesterolemia, I think, is more complex than what we know. Uh, I think there's an underlying biochemical process that needs to be understood, in addition to the fact that somebody is simply consuming too many fats. Those fats are rancid are probably not just the fact that you're consuming the fats and it's just staying in the blood. Those rancid fats are probably having an adverse effect on the metabolism of the liver in and of itself. And that may be the mechanism by which the cholesterol is high. So, so that, I'm glad you raised that because we didn't get a direct question to that, but I think this is an important point to raise. High cholesterol in and of itself could be just a simple sign as abnormal biochemical process or abnormal metabolism at the level of the liver or skeletal muscle, et cetera. And we need to understand that by treating the whole body with natural foods and removing all toxins, preservatives may help reduce that um, uh, that cholesterol level. Because I've seen patients with you know high cholesterol and they're doing all they can eating a plant based diet, and, and and I've seen people say, okay, go ahead and take a statin, but you know that's not the end of the story. And there's more you need to do, and so uh, you know that's that. Process. Yeah, I like I like to piggyback on that. Yeah, just the emphasis anti-inflammatory. You know, many times when our blood pressure is up, we have a lot of inflammation causing more plaque and sludge and narrowing of the blood vessels. So we want to emphasize an anti-inflammatory diet, and uh, that's what we get from live food is anti-inflammatory. So the more we eat an anti-inflammatory diet, we uh, not not just uh, against meats, but all the, the starches and the grains that, you know, that are prepared and things are done to, uh, you know, corn and GMO, you know, GMO corn and things like that. Um, it, it, wheat, of course, a lot of people think if they eat whole wheat bread that that is uh, good, but that is an inflammatory uh, component. So I just want to emphasize that anti-inflammatory component to get that blood pressure down. Now that's important, yeah. The anti-inflammatory and oxidative stress part of it. Uh, Dylan Lovelace, uh, I was diagnosed with heart failure. Does that mean for the rest of my life, I must eat only plant-based foods? No, just as long as you don't want to have heart failure. Um, <laughs> what about breads? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, stay away from the whole wheat bread. You know, Ezekiel bread generally is pretty good, but I, I, I'll say, I like to say it depends because, um, you know, we have a lot of patients with heart failure. It depends on how far along you are. And, and I, I have a lot of, I've developed a lot of respect for heart failure. And so the heart failure patients, I tend to be very aggressive with. People with systemic inflammatory conditions, I tend to be very aggressive with. Uh, and so um, I would say yes to the plant foods, but not just plant foods. You need to be very aggressive in terms of, you know, how pristine your diet is. And without knowing any details, I can't say more than that. But what I will say hypothetically is when I'm seeing someone with heart failure, I tend to put them on raw foods, uh, raw fruits and vegetables only. I tend to maybe do smoothie detox feeds. So I aggressively detox these patients. Plus, I'll put them on a high dose uh, liposomal coenzyme Q10, uh, MSM as a baseline, plus or minus. If they have systemic inflammation beyond that, uh, like joint disease and all that, I may add a liposomal curcumin and a liposomal vitamin C. Liposomal vitamin C is usually the third agent I'll add which helps reduce oxidative stress and to some extent inflammation. So the anti-inflammatory process is important as Dr. Atkins pointed out. Uh, and so you have to be pretty aggressive. So uh, yes to the plant-based diet, uh, I would say no to the bread because there are too many breads that are bad for you. The Ezekiel bread is a maybe uh, over time, uh, but that's there. 
Uh, this, we, and, and of course, our warning group, we're going over a little bit, a lot of great questions. How much water should we consume daily for proper hydration? You should consume enough. I and mean, I'm not being flipped <laughs> by that, but uh, anybody else want to take that uh, on? Um, I, mean, I, I just say rule of thumb, half your weight in ounces, but, uh, you know, so, you know, a 90 pound person would be a different amount than a 200 pound person. Uh, so that's a rule of thumb, but also how much exercise, how much you're sweating, being exposed to warm weather, et cetera, we need extra, but at least, you know, a good baseline is half our weight in ounces. I say water, um, non-caffeinated herbal teas, but of course, as you say, Baxter, uh, plant-based foods and vegetables and fruits have high water content. So we do get more from them. Yeah. I was gonna have something to add. So I don't I don't like counting water bottles and uh, doing it like that. So, so I, I don't do that. So I just try to do it based off of how I'm feeling. If I'm exercising, obviously I'm going to drink more. If I'm um, not, then it may be a little bit less, but eating definitely in the summertime, a lot of water-filled fruit. Um, so watermelon, um, cantaloupe are my best friends in the summer months. So just, yeah, so I try to do it that way because just drinking plain water is a little bit boring. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. The plant-derived waters are good. And one uh, barometer you can use, because it's hard to know, you know, as Dr. Ag alluded to, you know, yeah, this amount for this weight, but then what if you're exercising? What if you're this? You know, um, if your urine is clear as water, that's a simple little test to say that, okay, I'm hydrated, so the body's putting out a lot of clear water. If it's yellow, dark yellow, then chances are it's holding on to water. There's a lot of, you know, concentrate so you need to drink more so you can use that as a simple barometer you know hydrate yourself whether it's with you know clean alkaline water or ideally eating your water with a watermelon or whatever uh if your water your urine is completely clear like water that's a good sign that you're, you're pretty well hydrated you're just putting out extra water and so you know barring somebody with kidney disease or low sodium you know that would be what i'd recommend uh to be the case and um, Another quick thing, sometimes another way you can tell if your body's properly hydrated is your skin um, and how dry your skin is. You know, sometimes, and I'm thinking about the kids, I'm thinking about children, pediatrics. A lot of times kids are, you know, they have uh, very dry skin, eczema, um, rashes, and I feel like a lot of it's just from dehydration because they're not drink getting in. in Greetings, I'm Dr. Batson Montgomery. Thanks for joining us this evening. I want to share information about our FoodRx Healthy Lifestyle Series. The FoodRx Healthy Lifestyle Series is a comprehensive health and wellness coaching program designed to help you navigate your lifestyle towards optimal health. Do you want to reverse or control a chronic illness or reduce or eliminate medications? You may want to avoid potential surgeries or medical procedures, or perhaps boost your immune system or improve your fitness level or much more. The program starts with an intense five-session, four-week virtual coaching jumpstart phase where you join a group of like-minded individuals dedicated to improving their health. You'll be provided a lot of support materials, including nutrition plans, recipes, supplement plans as needed, or fitness plans, and much more. You have four-year access to the support materials as well as our health and wellness team during and at the completion of the four-week jumpstart period. To learn more about this program, Connect on one of our links below or schedule a call with our team members. Let them know if you wish to speak to me directly and they'll arrange a time for you. Optimal health is a lifelong journey. Let us help you navigate it to your most desired destination.